to day 929 of the Trump administration on the eve of what could be a very difficult day. And as much as all of this is uncharted territory, tomorrow we have this odd occurrence of the president of the United States flying into a place where a certain percentage of the population does not welcome him there. In the morning, he's going to head to El Paso and Dayton, two cities with a combined death toll of 31, all from gun violence during one 13-hour period in our country this past weekend. Dozens of people remain injured. Late today, the president said he plans to meet with, quote, first responders, law enforcement, some of the victims. That was followed by a message from White House Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham, who wrote, tomorrow will be about honoring victims, comforting communities, and thanking first responders and medical professionals. As advanced teams work out the details of the day, some public officials, particularly in El Paso, say the president's not welcome there. Democratic Congresswoman Veronica Escobar, whose district includes nearly all of El Paso proper, is among them. Citing his rhetoric about immigration, she, she says the president has placed a target on their backs. Escobar says she has declined an invitation to meet with the president tomorrow, saying this on this network a short time ago. Words are powerful and words have consequences. And the words that he's used to dehumanize us, to dehumanize communities like mine, to dehumanize immigrants, they have a consequence and they provide fuel for people who already are bigoted. The mayor of Dayton has also raised objections to Trump's visit. Today, she told reporters she plans to meet with him, but she made it clear she will be blunt. I know that, you know, he, you know, he's made this bed and he's got a lie in it, you know. Uh, he hasn't, you know, um, his rhetoric has been painful for many in our community. Uh, and I think that people should stand up and say they're not happy if they're not happy that he's coming. What are you going to tell him? Like how, how unhelpful he's been on this. I mean, yesterday his comments weren't very helpful to the issue around guns. Trump is visiting these cities as his administration faces several critical challenges, a volatile stock market, trade war with China, increasing threats from Iran, North Korea's continuing missile tests, which we'll get to later, and now new pressure for gun control legislation. With all that going on and under fire for his divisive language, Trump lashed out today at yesterday's statement by Barack Obama. It never mentioned Trump by name, mind you. It said in part, quote, we should soundly reject language coming out of the mouths of any of our leaders that feeds a climate of fear and hatred or normalizes racist statements. Well, this morning, Trump quoted what he'd heard on Fox and Friends. Did George Bush ever condemn President Obama after Sandy Hook? President Obama had 32 mass shootings during his reign. Mass shootings were happening before the president even thought about running for president. That was followed by, I am the least racist person. The White House also came to Trump's defense today. And I've seen Democrats on air saying he is responsible for this, that his rhetoric is responsible for this shooting, um, is responsible for these deaths, this murder. And that is a dangerous place to take this country. We would also never blame Barack Obama for the police shootings in Dallas. We wouldn't blame Bernie Sanders for the shooting of Steve Scalise or other Republicans. Today, NBC News reported that several federal agencies charged with fighting domestic terrorism are now struggling to do so, mostly because of cuts in funding and personnel. Tonight, a spokesperson for the House Judiciary Committee tells NBC News that committee members are mulling over an early return from their six-week summer recess to address gun violence. Given all that, here for our lead-off discussion on a Tuesday night, Jonathan Lemire, White House reporter for the Associated Press, Kimberly Atkins, senior Washington correspondent for Boston's NPR news outlet WBUR, and Katie Benner, Justice Department reporter for The New York Times. Jonathan, I'd like to begin uh, with you because of something one of your colleagues and a frequent guest of ours, Jill Colvin, has posted tonight. It has to do with the overall empathy deficit, let's call it, going into tomorrow. About the president, she says the words he offers for a divided America will be complicated by his own incendiary anti-immigrant rhetoric that mirrors language linked to one of the shooters. It is a highly unusual predicament for an American president to at once try to console a community and a nation 
at the same time he's being criticized as contributing to a combustible climate that can spawn violence. In the real world of uh, advanced teams and trips like this, there are ways you can reduce the president's exposure to the public, to be quite honest about it. He can go to just interiors of hospitals, just a tent with family and relatives and survivors, uh, just a firehouse and kind of limit his exposure that way. Give us a preview of tomorrow. Yes, I anticipate that we'll see something very similar tomorrow. That is what the White House, the tactics they've used in the past on when he's made some of these visits after a disaster, or after a tragedy, sometimes even when it's, he's on relatively friendly turf. Two examples. I was with him last fall when there was this significant wildfires in California, and we ended up down in Malibu for the second portion of it, and he met with victims, people who, had, who lost their homes or loved ones in those fires. They didn't, the press didn't see him at all. In fact, they met him in an airport hangar uh, at a local airport there in Southern California, no eyes on that whatsoever. Also, a year or so ago, when he went to Parkland, Florida, after that terrible school shooting, uh, the where a number of people, a number of those students, in the days afterwards, protested the president and really called for more gun action, more gun control, similar to what we're seeing now, particularly in El Paso. And the president went visited a hospital where he briefly met one or two of the victims, but spent most of his time on the ground thanking first responders, thanking medical technicians, certainly people who deserve the thanks and credit for what happened there. But those were a, a friendlier audience for him than perhaps coming face to face with some family members of, of de the deceased or wounded who would be protesting him and pressuring him to be doing more for gun control. And, and as, as, my, as Jill wrote, and we've been writing all weekend, uh, and this is not a role that comes easily for this president, right. even, even un, in if he was to visit a place where he was very popular. He, he's never been able to show much in the way of empathy. We all remember him going to Puerto Rico and tossing paper towels like they were basketballs yeah. to hurricane victims. Uh, he has, has struggled just this past weekend. I was with him in Bedminster, New Jersey, where he was when these shootings happened. We didn't see him for two days until uh, he remained in hiding, only tweeting about what happened. And his statements, perfunctory statements about the tragedy were followed up about with promote, tweets promoting a UFC fight. And when he did speak on the tarmac, he ignored the questions he didn't want to answer. And certainly his statement yesterday at the White House only raised more concerns about what this White House could actually try to do for gun control, but also how much blame he shoulders. Also, Kim, El Paso is a peaceful place, certainly prior to this. They can hear the president's words. Memories are long. I want to play for you some of what he said during his last visit to El Paso. Listen to these numbers. 266,000 arrests of criminal aliens, 4,000 kidnappings, and 4,000 murders, 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 killings, murders. We will. we will. But illegal immigration hurts all Americans, including millions of legal immigrants by driving down wages, draining public resources, and claiming countless innocent lives. So, Kim, about that reception in El Paso tomorrow, what's your preview? Yeah, I mean, I think the point that you bring up is important, that this is a peaceful community. This uh, attack that happened there, uh, that was more homicides than El Paso usually sees in an entire year. So this idea that is being painted by, this picture being painted by the president as this lawless place is just simply factually untrue. And in the case of El Paso, you have a community that is reeling from two simultaneous traumas. It's the scourge of gun violence that we have seen uh, happen repeatedly in this country. But there is also this idea of weaponized white supremacy that is growing in this country. And this is just the latest example of that. And you have people who are afraid, people who feel that they are under attack and that the messages like the ones you just played from the president is only fueling that environment. It's not just in El Paso. My colleague at WBUR wrote a piece about how Latinos in Boston feel afraid. It's mm -hmm. something that is a nationwide problem, and usually a job of a president is to try to be a healer at a time of division, and President Trump has shown that that is a demonstrable weak spot, just as Jonathan pointed out, whether it's a national disaster, natural disaster or some sort of attack on Americans, uh, President Trump has not been able to find the moment that President Bush did after 9-11 or that President Obama did after 
after the shooting uh, at Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. That's not something he is able to do, whether it's just not natural to him or because he thinks it's not politically advantageous to him. And Katie, uh, in the days since, we have heard terms like white supremacy and domestic terrorism. Both terms, it seems to me, are perfectly good descriptors of what we've seen. But along comes Rod Rosenstein over the weekend, kind of in this news cycle, a blast from our recent past, who called what happened white terrorism. What else did he share with your reporting team at The Times, especially if he talked about any potential solutions? Sure. The former deputy attorney general said that we need to start treating uh, domestic terrorism in the same way that we treat foreign terrorism. So that would mean surveillance. That would mean listening to chatter on the Internet. That would also mean intervening and trying to stop crimes before they happen. That is extremely tricky here in the U.S. We have a definition for domestic terrorism. It's the use of violence in order to coerce a population. It's the use of violence in order to try to get a message across or to change the political landscape. But we don't have a criminal statute. And we also have First Amendment rights here in the United States. So if you're an American citizen, you can be a member of a hate group and you can you can say hateful things on the internet. But until you commit a crime, it's very difficult to step in. So Rosenstein's point was that we can have a successful prosecution of uh, the shooter in El Paso. We can have a successful prosecution of somebody like Dylan Roof. But real success is to stop them before they begin in the same way that we have radicalized um, you know, folks who have, who have started, who have joined groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Hey. And that is a very difficult position. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.